I don't usually buy YouTuber merch, but when I do, I really put it to the test. Hey guys, CJ here with Elevated Systems, and as a small creator, I typically invest my own money into the gadgets and gear I showcase on the channel. With a limited budget, every purchase has to be purposeful and catered to the content I create, so you won't see me rocking a lot of merch from other YouTubers. Not because I don't want to support them, but mainly because it's often pricey and I've got my own brand to promote. However, lately I've noticed a shift in the YouTube community as creators are moving away from basic print on demand tees and novelty items to designing high quality practical products. You've got LTT with their well received screwdriver, Jerry Rig Everything and their razor knife, and Craft Computing who now create some pretty slick laser edged flasks and bottle openers in house. So now not only do you get to support your favorite creator, but you also snag yourself a genuinely useful product. Up until now, nothing has really enticed me to crack open my wallet. I've got my trusty DeWalt electric screwdriver, a cool razor knife from my kids, and I've been sober for over a year now. But then just a couple weeks back, a fellow YouTuber launched a product that generally fills a gap in my toolbox. So I went ahead and got it. This is the Gamers Nexus Flux Project and Soldering Mat. In today's video, we're going to put this bad boy to the test and see if it's worth the cash I spent on it. Now, I'll be upfront with y'all. I might have used the hype around a prominent YouTuber's product to reel you in. Did it work? Eh, maybe. But can I really stretch a soldering mat review into an entire video? <laughs> Not really. However, I will be using and abusing the mat throughout the video, doing things you probably shouldn't try at home, and we'll see how well it withstands the test. But that's not my main focus today. The star of this episode is an awesome retro refurb project where I'll be breathing new life into my vintage Commodore 64. Plus, I'll give you a quick demo of some common fixes for modern high-end hardware, saving precious gadgets from becoming e-waste. Ultimately, I'm here to show all tech enthusiasts why essential tools like a soldering mat and a rework station deserve a spot in your arsenal. All right, before we dive into the project, let's talk about the GN Flux soldering and project mat and why I decided to drop a cool 50 bucks plus an extra 20 for shipping. Legit question since I already have a few soldering mats in my arsenal. I've got a small one for those compact tasks like fixing up cell phones, a larger one for more sizable endeavors like the framework project I'm tackling now, and for the really big stuff, I've got this massive ESD mat. Now, while the stiffer silicone ESD material can handle some heat, it can't quite withstand temps up to 500 degrees Celsius like this more flexible silicon. Plus, it's not as resistant to chemicals as you can tell from the stains and marks on my ESD mat from previous projects. But that's where the Gamers Nexus comes in, offering the only extra large high temp resistant silicon soldering mat on the retail market. Compared to the 21 by 14 inch mats you find elsewhere, this GN mat is an absolute beast at 32 by 16 inches. Not only do I get more workspace with this mat, but it also comes with a bunch of recessed trays for organizing all my parts and tools. And the icing on the cake, it's got three legit spool holders. Most retail mats might include one that doesn't even hold a solder spool properly. So the bottom line is this, if you're in the market for a high temp flexible silicon soldering mat that's even bigger than anything else on the retail market, then the GN Flux project and soldering mat is pretty much your only option. But let's get our hands and the mat dirty with some real projects. And we're starting off strong with a classic, a 40 year old Commodore 64. Now this exact model is where I first cut my teeth soldering at the ripe age of 10. And let me tell you, it was a journey, but with the help of the guy at Radio Shack and a borrowed soldering iron, I replaced a blown capacitor and bam, the computer with later replacements of a faulty PLA and RAM chips served me another five or six years. Fast forward to today and I've acquired all the components to replace my very first computer setup 
and it's time to refurbish and repair each one. Now, except for the sound, this C64 works like a charm. I need to replace the SID chip, but first I gotta swap out all the 40 year old electrolytic capacitors because they're definitely past their maximum lifespan. Now for this job, I'm using my trusty Hacko desoldering tool. Back in 85, I didn't have one of these bad boys, but let me tell you, it makes the job a hundred times easier. It's a $200 tool, so if you don't want to drop that kind of cash, you can use something like a solder sucker pump or even some desoldering wick. But I'm a won't go to an amusement park without a fast pass kind of guy, so this was money well spent. I have it set to 350 degrees, so for this job, as I'm using lower temps, my ESD mat would be fine, but one of the big benefits of this flexible mat is that the PCB is held in place and doesn't slip around, so you don't have to worry much about damaging it. Anyway, back to desoldering. We just gotta melt the solder and suck it up. Super fast and simple. Let's get all these old caps out of here and bring this classic back to life. All right, so I've successfully removed all the old capacitors. I've also removed the components like the RF modulator unit, the SID, the PLA, and the VIC chips, which I'll be replacing with modern components. But you might be wondering, how do I figure out which new capacitor goes where? Well, back in the day, tech had this amazing aspect to it. You could actually get a full service manual for most devices, complete with components lists. Here's the original service manual for the Commodore 64. It's got a straightforward list of all the capacitors so I know exactly what goes where and comprehensive schematic that shows me every trace on the PCB, the function of each IC pin, and how everything interacts with the rest of the board. It's perfect for troubleshooting and repairing issues. Now, I realize that many of you watching might not be familiar with tools like an oscilloscope, but that's not really the point here. The main idea is that if you have the skills and tools, you should be able to repair your own equipment. For example, my RX 580 had an issue. Someone ripped an SMD off the back of the board. But I was able to find a schematic online, identify the component, order a replacement and solder it on, good as new. The problem is sometimes manufacturers don't make it easy to find the schematics or board layouts, like with this bricked MSI motherboard. It's an older model, out of warranty, but even though replacing a ROM chip is a simple task, if I wasn't experienced to know which of the several ROM or ROM-like chips is the BIOS ROM, I'd be left with a bricked board. What's worse, some companies actively prevent legitimate independent repair shops from accessing service manuals or tools and even build software locks into their devices to stop component replacement. These barriers remain in place even after the manufacturer considers the device end of life. Compare that to the 80s where Commodore didn't even repair your C64 under warranty. They just sent you to a local independent shop that could fix it for you. Or you could borrow your uncle's soldering iron and wing it. That's my little rant on right to repair. I'll link a good article on the topic in the description that'll explain it more intelligently than I can. But now let's get this PC back together. But first it needs to be clean. So let's get that done. All right, so I've managed to get the soldering mat all messy and it's now time to address one of the concerns that popped into my mind when I first got this. The giant embossed Gamers Nexus logo with its intricate crevices prevents me from just wiping the mat clean with a simple shop towel. You can see that there are even little pieces of solder stuck in there. Not good if I wanna power up and test this board. Now I get it, the logo's there because it's merch and a huge chunk of the folks who bought this mat 
probably did so for that very reason, but from a practical standpoint, I'd much rather have a flat, smooth work area that's a breeze to clean up. It's not practical to pause mid project, shift everything around, and haul the mat to a sink to rinse it off. One of the major perks of a mat like this is its chemical resistance. Let's say there's an exposed section of PCB that needs sealing with some conformals coating, aka nail polish. If I accidentally get some on the mat like I did right here, it's no big deal. It just wipes off. Model builders love these mats too since super glue and model glue can also be easily scraped or wiped away, but it, when it gets into the little cracks and crevices, now you gotta either scrape it out, once again, take the mat to a sink, but honestly, that's the only critique I have with the mat so far. Back to soldering, and capacitors are super simple to replace. These are polar, so you just need to make sure you put them in right, for the radial capacitors, the ones with the two leads coming from one side, the negative side is marked with a stripe and a negative sign, and that lead is shorter. And the PCB is marked with a plus and a minus. The axial caps have an arrow that points to the negative side. I usually bend one lead over to hold the capacitor in place, then using just enough heat to melt the solder, heat the lead and the via, and then add solder. Also, despite using rosin core solder, I still use a little flux as it just results in a cleaner and stronger joint. Okay, turbo mode. So here we are with a refreshed Commodore 64, equipped with some sleek modern upgrades. Although there's still some work left on the keyboard and case, I'm hoping you're currently enjoying some smooth B-roll footage showcasing the iconic blue and white screen of my C64. But let's keep moving because, let's be real, reviving vintage tech isn't everyone's thing, so let's shift gears and dive into more practical, common fixes for contemporary PC components. Earlier, I shared how a simple $2 tantalum capacitor replacement on a graphics card could save it from being tossed. Now I'm going to apply a similar fix to this unresponsive motherboard by swapping out the BIOS ROM. Using Kapton tape to safeguard the nearby SMDs, I'll start by wicking away as much of the solder as possible before turning to hot air to finish the job. After cleaning and tinning the pads, I'll place the new ROM and secure it with hot air. Just like that, a $2 repair keeps a motherboard from ending up in a landfill. And although I pre-flashed the BIOS with an EEPROM, you can easily find pre-flashed ROMs tailored to your specific motherboard. Next up, I scored a GTX 1060 on eBay for a cool 28 bucks, all because its six pin PCI power connector was toast. I've already removed the damaged part and now I'll solder on a new one following the same process I used for the C64 capacitors. Lastly, I've got a 2TB SATA SSD loaded with data, but sporting a busted data connector. This fix is a bit more challenging, but still manageable. I'll start by wicking away most of the solder from the pads, then carefully tackle each pin with hot air, taking care not to lift the pad or melt the plastic. Since this component doesn't get too hot, I'll reattach the donor connector using some low temp soldering paste. All right, so just in a single day, I managed to breathe new life into a vintage computer and resurrect four seemingly doomed PC parts from turning into e-waste, all using straightforward budget-friendly solutions and tools that anyone can master with a bit of practice. My main objective with this video is to motivate you guys to give it a shot, and I hope I've achieved that. 
I don't want to get called out for clickbait, so wrapping up with the GN Flux soldering and project mat, I have to say it performed admirably for all my projects. It's actually the only high temp solder mat I have that can accommodate an ATX motherboard, so it's definitely worth it just for the size. Now, you might have seen me doing some things I shouldn't do, like placing my soldering iron and hot air directly on the mat. Don't try that at home, folks. I was simply testing its durability and it withstood the heat impressively, but of course, I conducted a few more tests. I maxed out my soldering iron at around 480 degrees Celsius to see if the mat could handle it. We observed the classic color change, but it reverted back as expected. The maximum heat resistant isn't listed on the GN website, but typically these kinds of pads can handle around 500 degrees Celsius. And Gamers Nexus is currently doing some in-house chemical and heat resistant testing, and we'll be publishing an FAQ for the mat soon. Now I'll just set aside my soldering iron and grab my hot air gun Remember, don't ever do this at home. I placed the thermocoupler beneath the mat and exposed a PCB on the mat to 480 degrees Celsius air. The temperature underneath the mat only registered at about 63 degrees Celsius, which is perfectly normal. Of course, you saw me set the thing on fire in the opener. That's just what we call a hook in the biz and just, and was just isopropyl alcohol. The mat isn't flammable. My only real critique is the Embose logo trapping gunk, but I understand the reason for the design choice. After previewing this review, Steve from Gamers Nexus agreed this was a fair point and responded with this. We talked about that internally during design and ultimately went with the hex pattern and logo because it's so unbelievably hard to compete on price in the solder mat market. So we wanted to make sure we competed on quality and the design stood out. I think they met their goal and this would have been a hard sell if it was blank. One improvement I suggest is adding some magnetized compartments as many mats in this category feature those. I actually blew some tiny SSD screws out of one of the small compartments with my hot air gun off camera and they gone. <laughs> as for the $49.99 price tag, it's quite reasonable, especially considering it's a niche halo product. Sure. There's the creator tax, but I think most people will buy this to support the Gamers Nexus team and their content, which is precisely why I got it. I don't have much time to watch other tech YouTube content, but when I do find a few moments to catch up on high-end stuff beyond my production budget, nine times out of 10, it's Steve I'm tuning into. Steve also let me know that they priced this at a point where profit margins are very low and most of the cost is due to the relatively low production run compared to bigger manufacturers. So I think I'll buy another one for my garage workbench because I have no issue supporting creators I watch and respect with my wallet. And it just so happens that this product fits seamlessly into my workflow. If you'd like to support me and my content, be sure to smash that like button and subscribe. If you want to support me directly, I don't have merch, but I do have a Patreon page where you can check out some unscripted long form projects like what I did today and Project iFrame where I'm retrofitting a 2015 27 inch iMac with a framework mainboard. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.